Good morning. I was uh, just finishing up my breakfast when Ethan called me and told me that Route 17 was blocked at Route 90. And uh, he went down, thought he could get around, he didn't know where the blockage was, went down the next road and there was a stream there and the bridge was washed out. So it's like, okay, what am I going to do? <laughs> well, GPS, thank the Lord for GPS, took me up 131 and, and uh, I didn't have any trouble getting here. There was a couple places where the road, the uh, side of the road was washed out and one place there was gravel washed out across the road, but there was no problem. So now I have an alternative way to go. It's actually a very pretty drive coming up that way, so I may do that once in a while, at least going home. Um, but uh, praise the Lord, there was an alternative route. And praise the Lord, I actually have a phone that has GPS on it. A few years ago, that would have been the furthest thing from my mind. <laughs> Let's just uh, bow before the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us today. Thank you, Lord, for safety. And, and Lord, I just uh, think of those who are out dealing with the aftermath of the storm. Lord, whatever it was that closed off Route 17 and uh, places where there's power out. And Lord, I just pray for line crews and road crews as they work now that you might uh, grant safety for them. And now, Father, as we have gathered together here, I pray that you might work in our lives. Lord, this is your word. We're talking about a church that has qualities or had qualities that uh, we can think of as a an ideal church and Lord we would desire to be that kind of a church here and so Lord I just pray that you might speak to our hearts as we hear your word today I pray Holy Spirit that you might empower your word and especially me as I preach it for I pray in Jesus name because only he is worthy amen the church of Thessalonica was a church to give thanks for in spite of the very brief time that Paul had been able to spend with them that the, the church actually started. It had a very difficult beginning. We'll refer to that again later. But they had come to have spiritual qualities that are examples for us too to emulate today. Unfortunately, in the Christian world of today, the concern oftentimes in churches doesn't seem to be so much the spiritual emphasis and the growth of people that attend church, but it seems to be on externals. It seems to be that the main emphasis in churches, in, in some churches, not all churches, but in some churches today, the emphasis is on how many numbers we can get. How can we draw a crowd? And the churches that are drawing the crowds are the ones that have a tendency to become the ideal for other churches. And smaller churches see these numbers growing and they see what they're doing in order to accomplish their growth. And so they try that same thing. And what's happening is there are a lot of worldly methods that are being used in churches across this country to draw people that they call seekers. They call it a seeker-friendly way of doing things. You will not find anywhere in Scripture where God said to attract seekers to church. What he did say is that people are to be edified. And we saw that last week when we saw in Ephesians chapter 4 where the pastor, the evangelist, and the, those people that were given to the church, their purpose is to train ministry people for the ministry of the church so that the church may be edified. And that's the purpose of the church is to edify believers. And believers go out and they win people to Christ and they bring them to church. And so it's not our duty here in this service to attract seekers. Now, if they're seekers that come, that's one thing. But we ought not to have that as our purpose to draw them to this service by using worldly means. 
Remember we said last week that we all should not have the mentality regarding the work of the ministry of the church saying, well, that's what we pay the pastor to do. Yes, the pastor is supposed to do things, but he's to train his people how to do the work of the ministry so that they can do it and aid him in his work. Now we saw that Paul gave thanks to God for the Thessalonians and that his prayers for their spiritual well-being had been answered. And so he's writing a letter that, to them now to encourage them further in their faith and their walk with the Lord. And they began to look at the qualities that Paul saw in that group of people at Thessalonica that we took to make for an ideal church. First of all, we saw that their work was motivated by faith. And we observed that whatever we do that is not of faith, the Bible says, is sin. And then work is what they did, but they did all that as a labor of love. That is to labor, is to work, to toil or weariness. Love for God, but also love for others. And he commends them for that later in the book as well. Now we're considering what Paul said about the Thessalonian church, and we're looking at the quality, saying that it make for an ideal church. And the church had these positive qualities, but they were not a perfect church. Perhaps you've heard it said, if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. Because as soon as you do, you'll ruin it. There is no perfect church. And Thessalon the Thessalonican church, the Thessalonian church, was not a perfect church either. It had its problems, just like any church that has people in its membership. That pretty well covers them all, doesn't it? In Paul's second letter to them, in Thessalon 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, he has to address a particular problem. And in verses 10 through 12, he says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So the church while well, having qualities of an ideal church, had some people in it that weren't so ideal. They were not a perfect church, and so Paul had to deal with it. There are no perfect churches today either, including this one, right? None of us are perfect, and so we can't make up for a perfect church. Now today we are going to begin by talking about the third quality that Paul commended the Thessalonians for, which is found in verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Patience carries the thoughts of steadiness, steadfastness, constancy, and endurance. In the New Testament, one dictionary says that it is a characteristic of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate person and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. We will not spend a lot of time on that thought uh, today because we have addressed that when we were talking about cares and trials, but I do want to talk here about their patience of hope. Remember in Romans chapter 5 verses 3 and 4, we read, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. We said that hope comes as a result of the trials that we face, and as we go through them, we gain experience, and because we have gained experience that God has worked through our life in helping us through those trials, we therefore have hope that the, when the next trial comes, we will be able to get through that one as well, that God will help us with that. And so hope comes as a result of God's working on our behalf, and thus we gain hope for the future. Now, 
we talked about this a little bit, but we didn't actually cover it very well when we looked at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and we actually talked there about verses 6 and 7, the trials that he talks about being more precious than gold that perishes. But in verses 3 and 4, these are a couple of my favorite verses in the Scripture. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead gives us a positive, living, and enduring hope for the future. The promise of what we have for eternity to come has been promised to us by God that that is ours. He has a place in heaven reserved for us. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we'd have no hope. If there was no future in us or for us in heaven because Jesus hadn't raised from the dead, then we are most men. Mis wow, I'm getting my tang all tangled around my eye teeth this morning. Sorry. That's really bad when I get my teeth tangled around my. my uh, see, I can't even say that right. <laughs> Paul says we're of all men most miserable if Jesus didn't raise from the dead because there's no hope past this life. We're just like everybody else. They look like the grave. There's nothing beyond that. And we're just done. Praise the Lord, we have an adoring hope because Jesus was resurrected, because he was raised from the dead. And the writer of Hebrews claimed this in Hebrews chapter 6 verses 18 and uh, through 19. He says that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that within the veil. Today, there are all kinds of anchors. You have wall anchors and boat anchors and concrete anchors. There are all kinds of anchors. But the kind of anchor that I'm sure Paul is talking, or the writer of Hebrews, rather, is talking about is just a regular boat anchor. And you throw an anchor out and you make sure that you've got a good, firm place that you've got that is holding. Ethan and I were out fishing one day down on Chickiwaukee Lake and he had this anchor with him and he threw it out and wasn't holding. The bottom was too soft. It wasn't getting a good grip and so we just kept drifting along anchor or no anchor. <laughs> so you want to be sure that your anchor is in a good solid place and it's going to hold you where you want to be held. And so the writer of Hebrews says that we have an anchor that is firm, it's steadfast, it's sure. And that's going to keep us from drifting or being driven from our spiritual mooring in the storms of life. If we're not careful, and if we're not depending on that anchor to keep us sure and steadfast, we can drift. Some people even drift to the point where they lose their faith. Why? Because they're not depending on their anchor, Jesus. And they're not depending on that hope that they have because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So when our eyes are on the things that are eternal, God's word, his promises, the hope that they bring... They provide a solid means that those things which I just was talking about, about losing your faith or drifting spiritually, will not happen. Jesus is our anchor. We have an hope that those without Christ simply 
do not and cannot have. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14, Paul talks there and he's talking about the second coming of the Lord and he talks about those who lose loved ones and we are not like them who have no hope. People in the world without Christ have no hope. They don't have any hope that they will see a loved ones again. Believing that Jesus died and rose again is essential to our hope for the future. Now Paul gives us some evidence of the Thessalonians' patient hope or endurance back in 1 Thessalonians 1 again, verses 9 and 10. And he says this, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What we have seen here is that this church, even though they were waiting for the Lord to come back, they were not sitting passively. I don't know if you've heard there's a story of somebody who had predicted the second coming of the Lord, this pastor, and so everybody in the church sold all their possessions and they went and sat on the hilltop and waited for the Lord to come back. I don't know what they did after that because he didn't. But this church was active while they were waiting. And he says that they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. The hope we have that comes from knowing the security of our eternity enables us to patiently endure the trials that we face while actively serving the Lord. In light of that thought, note how Paul ties faith and patience together in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, where he says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of the love of every one of all of you toward each other abounds, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. In other words, in the words of Hebrews, their anchor was sure and steadfast. And Paul could write to them, commending them and thanking God that they were not drifting. Now beginning in verse 6, Paul's going to now give us some more qualities that could be listed as actions resulting from their work, labor, and patient hope. First of all, they became followers or imitators. He says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. First of all, they became followers of Paul and others. You notice there that Paul says they became followers of us. In other words, Paul said, you became a follower of me, as well as those with me, or perhaps others. This is not the first or only time that Paul spoke about in inviting people to be a follower of himself. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, he said, be followers of me. Then in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, he says, brethren, be followers together of me. Well, that seems rather conceited, doesn't it? For Paul to say, be a follower of me. But wait a minute, I only gave you part of those verses. The complete verse in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I'm following Christ, therefore you can follow me, because I'm following the right person. He wanted the Corinthians to follow him the same way he was following Jesus. Ultimately, it wasn't him that they, he wanted them to follow, but Jesus he wanted them to follow. And then in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, the whole verse says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. In other words, there are other people out there that you can follow as well, because they are walking following in Jesus. You ever played follow the leader? One person's a leader. Let's say his name's Gerald. And Gerald is going to determine where everybody's going to go. 
So everybody line up behind me. So everybody lines up behind Gerald. Well, the second person in line could say, okay, well, you can follow me too because I'm following Gerald. Now, hopefully Gerald's going to take them someplace that they all wanting to go <laughs> and someplace that's not dangerous, but we're all going to follow the leader. That's essentially what Paul's saying here in these passages that we've been talking about. Follow me because I am following the leader. The leader. The only one that we want to follow. The writer of Hebrews again says this in chapter 13 and verse 7. He puts the thoughts of following this way. He says, remember them which have the rule over you. Who has, that's the spiritual rule, your pastor, your church leaders. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation in other words their manner of life okay so I'm supposed to follow my pastor to what end it's like following the leader okay where's the leader going well the next verse says just simply Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever your leaders need to be following Jesus. And you want to be sure that they are following Jesus. And as they follow Jesus, then you can follow their example and know that they are going to lead you to him. The end, the main goal of our life and their lives is to know Jesus and to make him known. Paul confirms that thought of following him as he followed the Lord next, as he said, you followed us, but you followed the Lord. They knew that Paul wasn't the only one to follow. Verse 6, he says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. The Gospels record many times where Jesus said to someone or someones, Follow me. Most of those invitations, he was actually inviting them to literally follow him. He was wanting them to see how he lived. He wanted them to learn from him, to see how and what he taught, and learn from what he taught, and from the example of his life. But then there are examples where he invited men to become disciples. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then if one wants to be a disciple, he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In his discourse about being the door of the sheepfold, he said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And then at a later time, he said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. Are we actually following Jesus? Today there's a lot of people who are following a famous TV or radio preacher. Or some ministry. They give them their money, they go on their cruises, they attend their rallies, they faithfully listen to their programs. But are we actually following Jesus first? He is to be the primary one we're to follow and imitate at his invitation. Now, listening to radio and TV preachers, don't get me wrong, they're okay to listen to, but we ought not to be following them. We need to be sure that we're following Jesus. Writer named Sherm Nichols says this, he says, being a good imitator of the right person can be a good thing. Paul said the Thessalonians were imitating him and Jesus. Then he goes on, he says this, here's where it gets real personal. What if your friend, your neighbor, were to come here this morning and become a member of this congregation? Oh, that'd be great, you'd think. I've been praying for that to happen for quite some time now. I've been praying that this person would come here and become a part of the church family. Okay. What if that person became a member just like you? 
Go ahead, ask yourself, he says, what would happen if that person were to become the kind of member I am? Find a good example, he says, along and follow it and set a good example along the way, end quote. It's kind of pointed, isn't it? So how was it the Thess Thessalonians became followers? We find out that they became followers having received the word in much affliction. You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost of the Holy Spirit. Now we spoke of this from the history that we just talked about briefly from Acts chapter 17. And remember that there were many people in Thessalonica who believed Paul's message, but the Jews had gotten jealous of the fact that Paul's ministry was being so effective and they were losing numbers. And so they had caused this great uproar in the city. And looking back on that time, Paul's thankful. The church group, the people that he had led to the Lord there, had continued to follow Jesus in spite of that uproar. Now, that could have discouraged them to see such an uproar come over the fact that they had come to follow Jesus. But they had persisted in following him anyway. Paul had been concerned about their faith in spite of persecution, which we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. He says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed thereto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer persecution, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I could stand it no longer, he's saying here, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Paul wanted to be sure that they had not fallen away under the persecution that had come upon them. I want to share a story with you that I've edited quite a bit that comes out of the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. It's uh, this month's magazine. And it's about a woman named Sanjana, a young woman. Sanjana came to faith in Jesus Christ about the age of 13 through the witness of a Christian neighbor who gave her a copy of the Gospel of Matthew, which she wrapped in a plastic bag and hid in a hole in the ground. She found it to be the complete opposite of what she experienced in her Muslim home, decided to become a follower of Jesus, and found a peace that she had never known before. She says, for the first time in my life, I was not worried. I was not afraid. I had peace. And that sense of peace never left her in the four years of torment that were going to follow Sanjana's father soon noticed that she had stopped praying five times a day, which is required in Islam. And when he asked her about it, she boldly told him about her decision to follow Jesus, to trust in Christ. Her father's response was predictable. He beat her. What is this nonsense you are talking about, he asked. We raised you as a Muslim, and you have to continue as a Muslim. Our sons were born as Muslim. Our grandfathers are Muslims. So you are Muslim. But Sanjana was unmoved. When her family saw that Sanjana was serious about her new faith, they challenged her. I believe in Jesus, Sanjana told them. Her father beat her again, and this time he tied her up and locked her in a room on the family compound. Sanjana spent the next three years locked in that room. Half starved, beaten continually. She said, my father would start to beat me, she said, and when he got tired, my other family members would take over. It was like a party. The beatings resulted in a broken arm, fractures in her neck and shoulders, and family members used acid to try to remove a small cross tattoo she had gotten on her arm to indicate her belief in Christ. 
Finally, they decided to try the ultimate humiliation. Sanjana's father and brother bought an imam to her room with the understanding, that's a spiritual leader, with the understanding that he had permission to rape her if she would not return to Islam. Sanjana screamed for help as the imam sexually assaulted her, but no one came to her aid. The injustice and the horror of Sanjana's treatment, however, persuaded her younger sister to leave Islam and follow Christ. She helped Sanjana escape that night, and the two women fled to Cairo where they slept on the street. But Sanjana's freedom did not last long. A family member soon found her and dragged her back to their home in Upper Egypt. They beat her almost to death, her pastor said. I don't know how she survived this beating. Then her family forced her to marry a Muslim man who locked her in their apartment and went about the task of reconverting her to Islam. After a year of marriage, when he found nothing was working with her, he was afraid that the neighbors would find out about her becoming a Christian, and that would shame him, so he divorced her. Sanjana was baptized in 2016. She said that as the pastor lowered her into the water, she felt like Jesus was speaking to her, confirming that she was his daughter. She says, I wanted to hear Jesus more, laughing at how she almost struggled with the pastor to keep her underwater longer so she could hear more of that precious voice. When asked why she never rejected her faith in Christ during the years of severe abuse, she said, I am an ambassador to my God now. How can I become a slave once again? Today, Sanjana works part-time as a tailor, and although it pays only enough to cover her basic needs, she ties faithfully because she knows that it honors the Lord Whatever I do for the Lord, she said, I can never give him what he has given me. I regret all the years that passed without me knowing him. While she's been rescued in a variety of ways, Sanjana's life remains challenging. She needs to find a new place to live soon. She's still rejected by society. But watching her prepare coffee for visitors, you would never guess that she has experienced such deep suffering. The peace she found in Christ continues to sustain her. God gave me a promise, Sanjana said, and I trust his promise. God is always good. Then they invite us to join Sanjana, who has replaced hatred with forgiveness in praying for her father's salvation. We have no idea what persecution is. Paul was thankful that the church at Thessalonica hadn't swerved when they were persecuted. We get intimidated and afraid to witness sometimes just thinking what someone might say. The chances of them beating us nearly to death, or putting a gun to our head and shooting us because we witness to them is not impossible, but not very probable. Do we really believe God about what he says about persecution? Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted, divinely favored, are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. The fourth action that comes about here is that they showed genuine repentance at salvation. And how did they do that? In verse 9, back in 1 Thessalonians 1, 
For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Some time ago we looked at Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 3 and 4. And if you remember talking about that, that, that passage of scripture talks about idols of the heart. We may not have idols of stone or metal or wood or whatever in our homes that we bow down to, but we may very well have idols of the heart. And we need to show genuine repentance and following Jesus by turning away from those idols so that we worship and walk after only him. The next quality that Paul talks about here is that they became examples to all believers reaching down through the centuries now, even to us today. What a testimony. We spoke earlier of following positive examples, and Paul reveals that the, Thessalon the Thessalonians themselves became examples. In chapter 1 and verse 7 again, he says, So that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. That would be like saying the church at South Somerville became examples to all the churches and the believers in Maine and New Hampshire. Wouldn't that be a great reputation to have and testimony, huh? Earlier, we had read in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an example. Our lives should be an example to those who are younger in the faith. They should be able to follow us, and even those who are younger than us in age, as they see us as we walk with Jesus. And we ought to be able to say, as Paul said, follow me. If our lives are not a positive example, then we may actually become a hindrance to someone in their walk, spiritually speaking. Become such a stumbling block that they may choose to never follow him. Our lives may become such a stumbling block if we're not walking after Jesus, right? So that when we go to witness to somebody that we know, they say, are you kidding? You want me to become a Jesus follower and you're supposed to be one? Uh-uh. How many times have you heard someone talk about hypocrites in the church? It'd be interesting to ask them to name some. But unfortunately, even though that's an excuse, it's too often true. But then again, who is the church supposed to minister to? People that need to know how to walk properly. The third action that we find here is in verse 8. They became missions-minded. Paul says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Spreading the gospel is the primary work of the church. They reached out to the whole all of Macedonia and Achaia, and then they send out workers with Paul. We find that in the book of Acts, chapter 20 and verse 4. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus. They sent people to help Paul in his travels. We need to be thinking of our outreach. Last week we talked about going out that door, and when you go out that door, you walk into the mission field. We need to be missionaries to our own people. Listen to this story. This is a story taken from New Tribes Mission. A man named Sudawama of the Basorio tribe of Papua New Guinea. One evening when Sudawama was about two years old in the Lord, he wa walked to George Walker's house, one of the missionaries, and knocked on the door. George was already in bed, but he got up to answer. Hey, Sudawama, what's up? He asked. I just want you to know that God heart, the Basorio term for the Holy Spirit, I just want you to know that God heart has been speaking to me. He told me that he wants me to be involved in sharing God's word with people who have never heard it. 
That's all. I just wanted you to know. Sudawama left. George went back to bed. Sudawama's father-in-law lived a three-day hike into the jungle. The people in that village knew nothing of the word of God. So Sudawama went and stayed there for many weeks. He taught the people the chronological Bible lessons, just as he had been taught, and led that group to the Lord. Afterwards, he hiked back to his own village. One day, he came to Bob Kennel's house, another missionary. Bob, he said, I really need a blackboard. Those believers do not have the ability to read the Word of God. I want a blackboard so I can teach them how to read and write. Bob helped Sudawama make a foldable blackboard. Sudawama took flashcards, put the blackboard on his back, and returned to the hamlet. He was not a literacy teacher, but he had the burden to teach the people. His students learned to read and write the Basorio language. A couple months passed after Sudawama taught the people to read and write. One day he showed up on Bob's doorstep. He came into the house opened the string bag where he kept his earthly belongings and found a small coin purse. From it, he took all the money he owned and put it on the table. He looked at Bob in the eye and said, How many testaments, New Testaments can I buy with this? I want to take them back to the people in the hills. The next day, Sudawama headed off on a three-day hike, gave the believers the New Testaments, and then hiked back to his own village. He reported, My in-laws and the others in that little village came to me and said, Sudawama, why do you do this? Why do you keep going back and forth? Why don't you stay down in your own village? You can make a nice garden. You can fix up your house and live like other Basorios. Sudawama replied, The Apostle Paul never said that being an evangelist would be easy. He went through hunger. He went through thirst. He was beaten by bandits. I've been through nothing compared to him. It's not supposed to be easy. There's going to be a cost involved in serving the Lord. And when God's heart speaks to me and tells me to quit, then I'll quit. Until then, I'm going to continue sharing his word with others. Have you ever been impressed by a missionary telling how people that they're reaching out want to tell their neighbors and they want to go to the next village and you think, wow, that's amazing, that's great, that these people are wanting to reach people around them They want to tell these neighboring villages or tribes the gospel, and so they send out their own people to accomplish the task. It's becoming very popular today, and rightfully so, I think, to focus on supporting local missionaries that already know the work, already know the, the language, already know the culture, and so churches are encouraged to support these local national missionaries because they're reaching their own people and they don't really need foreign missionaries. And it's easy for us to get excited when we hear those things and it's easy for us to give money to support those foreign missionaries, those local missionaries, and then we feel that we've done our part in missions. But all the time, we're letting someone else do our mission work for us. We as individuals and as a church need to be working in our mission field, just as Sudawama and those other missionaries that we tend to support today are doing in their local town. They are no different than we are. They're just people that came to know Christ like we are, and they're just going across the street and reaching their neighbors, and they're just going into the next town. They may walk there. They may ride a bike there. They may ride a donkey cart there. They may ride a motorcycle there, but they're going. 
to the neighboring communities, sometimes miles and miles away, to tell other people the gospel. In the same way that we need to be doing right here. We're just local people living in a local town with neighbors just like them, and they're doing it, but do we? I stand here as one guilty of not being the missionary that I ought to be, either. I don't claim standing here this morning to be an example of a missionary for you to follow when it comes to that. I'm sorry. I get convicted by that myself. I'm not all that I ought to be either. God wants us to be missionaries in his field where we are. Now it's possible that I trust that God may take some of our young people here and he may send them to a field across the big puddle someplace. But all of us need to be missionaries right here, right now. Let's pray. Father, this morning we have seen how the church at Thessalonica had qualities as a church that are examples for us of how we as a church should be working out our faith, our labors of love, and our patience of hope. And how we are to be mission-minded Lord, it's good to be supporting missionaries, and this church does. And I thank you for that. But Lord, we also need to be encouraging and supporting each other to be faithful and ministering to those who are around us right here. In South Somerville and the towns from which we come. So Father, I just pray that you might uh, take and convict us by your spirit as a, in the days ahead to be faithful in reaching out to others as we ought to do. We pray in Jesus' name.